The following is a production of the 362,000 member National Taxpayers Union. We're joined by a very special guest, Ryan Radia of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. As readers of our blog and those who have been following us recently know, uh, NTU has been active on the FTC and antitrust recently. And uh, we thought we'd have Ryan in to talk about antitrust and tech issues in general and just the current landscape with regard to regulation and tech because it has become a very big topic. So welcome, Ryan. Hey, glad to be here. So I'll just start off first uh, and quickly ask you, I mean, what you view as uh, the sort of the current environment with the FCC and FTC uh, and their efforts. I mean, obviously, net neutrality has already been big for a number of years. Uh, what's sort of the situation with these agencies looking to regulate and get involved in the tech industry? They're already involved. They're active. They're either intervening already or threatening to intervene in an array of sectors. When okay. They, uh, you talk about spectrum transfers, like the AT&T and T-Mobile deal. There's activity there with the FCC. Any proposed arrangement that involves the acquisition of two of one tech company by another, whether where there's any real size to that deal will be subject to scrutiny by either the FTC or the DOJ, which together enforce uh, America's antitrust laws. Between these three agencies, there has been a pretty great deal of scrutiny toward the tech sector over the last few years, and it's only looking like that will increase in the coming years if what the agencies have been doing lately is any guide. Right, and I think we see that, and NTU's a little specific in terms of our uh, actions lately on the antitrust side of that. Um, I would ask, I mean, we're seeing uh, the Internet as, in, as a major sector of the economy has grown a lot. Uh, I think from our point of view, we're very concerned about uh, taxes and regulation sort of slowing down the economy. Uh, is there a threat there that this sort of booming sector will be uh, hampered by this in the future? Well, th there, there are a few things there to unpack. The question of whether companies are going to be broken up is one where, fortunately, there doesn't seem to be too great a risk of that, but that may change with, with Google, which we can talk about in a moment. Uh, what, what's called structural remedies and antitrust involves a court ordering a company that has been convicted of violating the antitrust laws to essentially dismantle a, a part of its business. For instance, um, there were many back in the old Microsoft wars who called for the government to force Microsoft to split off its operating system division and office software division and so forth. We have not seen anything that extreme occur in the United States uh, in, the, in the internet industry, but the way that the FTC is proceeding with Google, if it does choose to file a complaint, it may seek a remedy that involves the separation. That's certainly, uh, I think, the the furthest it would go, and there are, there are remedies that uh, could be ordered short of that. But even less robust or less uh, interventionist remedies still really pose a, a big threat to this sector. It is, of course, as you mentioned, very dynamic, very innovative, a huge number of New jobs are being created through the Internet sector. Economic growth is fueled by it. And ultimately, in a very competitive global marketplace, it's the Internet, the high-tech world, social media, where the United States really is the world leader. There, there aren't very many major prominent Internet companies uh, that are household names headquartered in, in, uh, in the East Asian countries or in Europe where, where the economies are just as developed as ours. A big part of that, to me, is uh, that our government, our public policies, while decidedly imperfect, foster innovation more effectively because we tend to give companies the freedom, especially in frontiers, areas where we don't fully understand what's going on and what the risks are and what the benefits are. We tend to let those companies thrive and succeed or fail, whereas other governments tend to have a much more skeptical approach of innovation, especially where things like privacy uh, our competition are at stake. The threat is that new regulations, such as pro proposed privacy regulation that many are pushing for in Congress, maybe involving new authority to the FTC, could put a real damper on the internet industry, much of which is fueled by the use of data, big data as it's called, whether you're talking advertising or a lot of other forms of data use. Not on the competition side, companies are now creating new markets all the time. 
the old sort of century, uh, centuries ago view of, of the, the late 19th century that a company that managed to reach the top of a market probably deserved to be the victim of some governmental action, lest consumers suffer, doesn't make much sense anymore when companies are frequently creating new markets uh, from, from whole cloth where they never previously existed. At the same time, of course, a lot of the factors that allegedly justified a, a strong level of antitrust enforcement, things like entry barriers, information asymmetries, inertia of institutions and so forth, don't seem to exist in the internet world, where depending on where which market you're discussing, competition is right around the corner. Existing incumbents always have to watch their backs or they'll be trampled by a newcomer. And change is constant. It's everywhere. Companies don't have the luxury, no matter how big they are or how small they are, of simply resting on their laurels. If they do, they will fail, and many companies that were once giants are are barely heard about anymore. I mean, AOL used to be the world, the nation's biggest internet provider. Now, uh, it's a relatively small online content company for the most part. It still offers internet, but it doesn't offer too much of it. Likewise, we once saw Alta Vista, uh, Lycos, Excite, websites like those at, at the top of internet search. And back in the 1990s, today, of course, Google is the leader. Lately, Bing has been catching up quite a bit, uh, but Google still remains ahead. All of these fields, have a great deal of change and they're unpredictable, they're dynamic, and entry doesn't seem to be all that difficult. Uh, although, of course, it, it can be in certain sectors. It's not going to be easy, for instance, to topple Facebook. Uh, it's probably unlikely that they have to worry about that happening tomorrow, but that doesn't mean that something won't happen that severely threatens their business uh, in the next few years. You know, For a while, when people wanted to post what they were doing for their friends, they would do it as a Facebook status update, whereas Twitter now is probably used just, just as frequently for that purpose. Uh, likewise, everyone thought MySpace was the king of social networking, but then Facebook came along and MySpace, you know, was basically obviated in a matter of in a matter of a couple of years. And is now really the the, the the domain of music. Otherwise it's not really a social network that's used by all that many people on a regular basis, uh, compared to Facebook. So all of these factors suggest that there's probably a very limited role for government in the internet, which is of course to police fraud and, and stop force from being used, which involves combating uh, deceptive trade practices where companies are lying and so on, and forcing agreements between companies and their users. But the role that some in this administration see of government and many in Congress, and especially in regulatory agencies, is troubling because it reflects a misunderstanding of how this industry and this, the, this sector works, and it threatens to kill what you might call the goose the lay of the golden egg, which is our uniquely pro-innovation climate that has allowed all of these success stories to pop up and become established companies and employ lots of people around the world. Well, you make an interesting point there, Ryan, about the unique culture of innovation in the United States. Could you talk a little bit about how this whole issue of antitrust seems to be coming increasingly internationalized, almost in sync, I guess naturally, with the fact that business itself is becoming internationalized. We're seeing philosophies among European antitrust authorities creeping their way into the U.S. antitrust psyche. What do you think that might mean for the future of antitrust and industry innovation here in America? It doesn't bode well to me that American officials are looking to their European counterparts on antitrust. While there's certainly a lot we can learn from other countries in an array of areas, antitrust competition policy is not one area where uh, Europe has good lessons to teach. Because for the most part, there are some exceptions, such as their, the European guidelines uh, on, on certain mergers, which, which could be said to be more clear-cut. But in general, there's a big problem of multiple competing, essentially regulators who police competition are um, um, competing among themselves. There's this metri metric that many in the competition policing world seem to believe is how they measure success, which is how many successful actions are they bringing? How many companies are they breaking up? How many fines are they levying? 
Um, one of the uh, a good way of thinking about why this is absurd came from a former FTC chairman, Bill Kovacic, who said at a recent event out in Aspen, the Technology Policy Institute, that the way that we often look at antitrust intervention is looking at planes and determining the success of an airline by uh, how many planes depart and not how many planes land. You, know, you don't measure antitrust success by how many big cases are brought. You measure it by the degree to which it's actually benefiting consumers. And in many cases, that may well be through less intervention than more. But in a drive to harmonize laws and regulatory regimes around the world, which on, on one hand does make some sense, it's better to have one set of rules than another, all else equal. The problem is when other governments, when other regimes like the European Commission have, in some respects, more troubling antitrust policies than our government, the result of harmonizing, just as in the world of tax policy, could be simply increasing the burden of government on everyone. The last thing that we should do in America is adopt the same flawed uh, ideas about how to think about competition that have been adopted by Europe. That that certainly poses a challenge to companies that that, that, that those leading the company, their top lawyers and executives, might have to be dealing with not one but several antitrust regulators. For instance, Google is, is now potentially going to be the subject of an FTC complaint. They are already being investigated in the European Commission and they are in talks with the leaders there about a potential settlement. There is action going on in, in South Korea, just all around the world. The company is facing uh, similar threats from different entities. But there simply doesn't seem to be any alternative other than con simply convincing uh, all governments, including ours, to be sure, to adopt less interventionist policies in the world of policing competition, because companies are going to operate around the world. Certainly, we have seen some companies pull out to a limited extent, like Google in China, but for a company to not maintain any presence in the European Union is to essentially forego a massive global market. At some point, that may be an option that companies take, that companies will simply only do business in the markets where they see the government as being reasonable. And if we've already seen, for instance, like nanotech companies uh, in the United States have considered leaving to places like Singapore that have more pro innovation policies. But that's that's certainly one possible outcome, but a, a more realistic outcome, which is what we have today, is the companies simply just live with an array of conflicting uh, competition regimes. And they're forced to admit the reality that. Um, one regulator, like the European Commission, might be essentially in a war, in a in a battle with an American regulator to see which can score the bigger fish. It's certainly a perverse incentive that doesn't align with the welfare of consumers. But as a as a public choice analysis, it of course makes sense that if you're regulating a sector, you're going to want to measure wins, and the easiest way to do that, if you're in the competition business, is to see how many big companies you take down. The metrics of how much that affects consumers probably won't come out for years after the case is abroad, and people won't look back and really criticize the case for being brought. Today, for instance, we can look back at Microsoft and say, did it really ever matter that the government brought an action against Microsoft? Would we still have had the same level of growth in the, in the browser world that we did have? The answer certainly appears to me to be yes, in that, in that what ultimately took down Microsoft wasn't... Um, wasn't its inability to uh, bundle browsers, but it was the fact that people wanted to install a different browser, namely Mozilla Firefox and now more recently Chrome. So whatever alleged threats a big company like Google today poses to competition, it's, there's a very good chance that we won't see those threats the same way in a few years, that the dominance that any particular company has is probably going to be relatively fleeting, or even if it persists, that it's likely to be relatively unimportant. No one is obsessed over operating systems today because of platform independence. Most programs work across multiple operating systems, and no one is really fighting to be in control of the operating system because it's all about being in control of where people buy their music, where they store their documents in the cloud, where they buy things on the, on the web, and all that stuff, where the questions don't have anything to do with what antitrust regulators used to think was important. It's just a testament to how little foresight we have by trying to figure out what competition will look like in a few years and what the threats to it are.
and and specifically discussing uh, consumer interests here with regards to the Google case. Uh, what do you think about the validity of the argument um, that the advertisers on Google are actually the consumer and that users are the product? I mean, how does that stand up in terms of uh, antitrust history and what you what you notice in the tech sector? So in a sense, that's actually a fairly good way of looking at it in that uh, Google doesn't, of course, generate much revenue from its users. So that, that has somewhat changed in recent years with the advent of of Google's offerings to businesses and Google apps. But generally, it's the advertisers who pay Google's bills. I, I believe something like 98% of their revenues come from users. Thus, Google's challenge is to deliver as many eyeballs as it can to advertisers and do so in a way that uh, essentially connects buyers and sellers as effectively as possible. To me, that's a you know, virtuous cycle. It's not a new business model, uh, although it's certainly a new flavor on an old one. Broadcasters have been doing it for years with, with free over-the-air TV, which, which is, as of course, uh, entirely supported by ads, uh, albeit with a little product placement and other sales. So if one wants to make the argument that Google is violating antitrust law, looking at how advertisers are doing is certainly going to lend itself to a better analysis. Of course, it doesn't follow from that viewpoint that Google is actually engaging in competitive harm. It, you know, it's difficult, for instance, to say that that consumers are being directly harmed, as in well, internet searchers, because they're not really paying Google anything. They're The only thing that they're forsaking for the sake of Google is their, um, their, their information and their time. The information, of course, is non-rival good. It doesn't cost me anything to type in a search to Google. There are, there are people often say they sell your data, which is um, a shorthand for something that's actually not that. It's what Google, of course, does is connect the data that you enter with advertisers in a way that doesn't actually let the advertiser know what you search for or what websites you visit. Whereas in the world of advertising, if Google were, in fact, the dominant entity in the advertising space, it, it could maybe have the incentive and the ability to hike ad, ad prices. There, there are some interesting reasons, however, to think that's not a legitimate concern based on the facts. First, of course, is the bidding process that Google uses to determine how much it charges for its search ads and its uh, display ads and its text ads on websites. Essentially, Google seemingly does not have the ability to directly say we're going to charge five dollars more per, per million clicks or per thousand clicks because the demand would have to have to be be there of course if it were to change how it priced ads one might be able to argue differently but as it stands i haven't seen any data that suggests that google is on its own uh, increasing the prices or decreasing the quality of the services it offers to what are arguably the core customers advertisers then there's a un question of whether there's really even any dominance in the world of advertising by any one company. Whereas you can make a reasonable case that if you're doing an internet search, it's probably on Google or on Bing or on Yahoo, which is, which is of course, Bing-powered. And, and Google can, it just can control the majority of that market. In the world of advertising, Google is actually a very small fish because the advertising market is so huge. It's over $300 billion a year in the United States alone, uh, I believe. Google represents... A, a, real, a fairly small chunk of that. An advertiser who faces a massive price increase by Google is not captive to one company. It can go to a different place to advertise. And it doesn't have to go to another search engine. It can go to uh, to display ads where Google is not dominant, to, um, to offline ads, you know, television ads, newspapers, billboards, all of these ways to get your product and your brand out to consumers that don't have anything to do with internet search. So it's fairly misleading to characterize Google as having any real power to harm advertisers unless you can show that advertisers really do view Google as a, as a, a service that cannot be substituted. That, that their willingness to leave doesn't exist. Of course, even if you establish that, that Google is dominant and that it has the incentive and ability to engage in harmful behavior, you still have to figure out if it actually is. If, if one of the problems with antitrust law is 
the, the ability to increase prices in a significant non-transitory manner, it, it, it follows from that that, that a monopoly uh, exists. But it doesn't follow from that that consumer welfare is being harmed. There may be situations where a business is charging higher price for its products uh, in the short run or in the medium run uh, might actually lead to greater innovation. It's the, it's the Schumpeterian idea of dynamic competition where you don't, you don't actually want um, every company to be charging a price at which marginal cost equals marginal revenue, where you, you like monopolies knowing that no one monopoly will be, will be enduring, but that you will have fleeting monopolies that will le leapfrog each other in the race for innovation. Uh, perhaps even if one proves that Google does have monopoly power and is, in, is engaged in a practice that is generating more profits than it ought to if it were a textbook perfect competition market, perhaps that's better for consumers because it, it increases the likelihood that uh, the next Google will emerge and to try to figure out an even better way to index the web or change the game entirely when it comes to how we search for and access information. As, as is often uh, observed by those who track where people find information on the web, it turns out that Twitter and Facebook are a huge uh, um, percentage of of sources, of, of places where people find other websites. In fact, Facebook is now working to enter search itself and, and hopes that its vast amount of information that no one else has will let it figure out an even better way to index the web than Google, uh, in, in large part powered by social data, by knowing what your friends think. So all of these things suggest that we may not need to be as worried as we tend, we are today about companies that are engaged in so-called monopolistic practices where they're charging super competitive prices. These, these may be virtuous actions, not actions that we ought to penalize, yet it's, it's often overlooked when looking at an antitrust case of the importance of this process, in part because the agencies who enforce the antitrust laws take a short-term view. To, to, to the FTC, one year is long-term, whereas in, in measuring innovation, it should be done over a decade or more. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, we also have to think of the other side of the coin here, don't we, Ryan, about there are regulators who say, well, if we don't step in quickly, who knows what kind of competition or consumer harm could uh, have otherwise been prevented. We, we need to anticipate and try and jump in before these monopolies suddenly spring up. But I would say, isn't there an equal, if not greater, harm of the kind of innovation that ends up getting quashed if regulators intervene so early and so often in developments like these? That's sort of the unseen harm from these folks being overzealous in their regulatory practices. That's a very important point. The question of whether to err on the side of over-enforcement or under-enforcement is a challenging one, given that it's unlikely that with how little we understand about markets, we'll be able to perfectly identify true bad actors without penalizing good actors. This notion of error costs was articulated probably most effectively by Frank Easterbrook, who's a federal judge and has written uh, uh, about antitrust law for uh, many years, he argues that between false positives, where we, uh, we wrongly identify a company as having committed an antitrust wrong, where it has, has not, versus false negatives, um, where we incorrectly identify a company as not having engaged in an antitrust violation, where in fact it did, we, sh we should err on the side of minimizing false positives because dynamic market processes can correct anti-competitive behavior over time. So even if Google is truly engaged in behavior that is harming competition, but we're not sure if they are, letting the many other established players on the web work to dethrone Google, as we're seeing from Microsoft and Facebook, along with the array of forces that are aligned against 
any particular company of any size, from shareholders to the media to potential newcomers to joint ventures between existing players, all of these forces stand ready to combat a, a monopoly that might endure a few years too long. On the other hand, when we squelch an innovator by wrongly accusing it of violating the antitrust laws, um, the, the processes by which innovation occurs nonetheless are much less robust. When, when a, a, a company has figured out a great way to create wealth and is working and cr coming up with even better ways and we stop it in its tracks, the unseen costs that you mentioned are, are very real. They're very difficult to, to measure. So all of this counsels a, a, a toward the antitrust restraint that we should not focus on prophylactic intervention. We should focus on intervening only uh, late in the game where clear harm has been showed to occur rather than trying to intervene early, trying to intervene before monopolies actually emerge and engage in harmful behavior practices. Instead of trying to detect pre-crime here, we should be trying to focus on the really, really bad actors, companies perhaps that are engaged in naked price fixing, um, rather than essentially look to any really successful company and try to figure out some way in which it might be hurting a competitor. I think that's a really good place for us to stop because we are running a little low on time, but I uh, really appreciate uh, Ryan joining us today. Again, that's Ryan Roddy with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Excellent insight. Thanks. Thanks for having me.